So cloud-based machine learning for the developer. Quick introduction of myself, so Peter Myers, I've been an independent business intelligence specialist now for about 15 years. Uh, a career that evolved quite by accident. I completed a degree in economics, I worked as a trade analyst for a shipping company, I ended up living in Sydney for part of that time, but the tool of those days to help me consolidate and report on data was Lotus 123. And in those days, I just spent a lot of time just bringing in data, writing incredible macro strings that were just character after character. Uh, but ultimately, I discovered that someone foolishly installed Access version 2 on my desktop. And I learned that if I could get my data out of a spreadsheet into what was called a table in this relational database management system, then I had superior manipulative capability to work with it. And really, my career took off from there. Meeting the limits of access moved me across to SQL Server, SQL Server 7 in the days, 2000. The business intelligence suite were then released with analysis services and data transformation services. And then .NET in February 2002. I worked on ASP.NET when it first became available. And pretty much my career has uh, led me on this extraordinary path of uh, becoming a practitioner and a presenter and trainer uh, in Microsoft data products, principally SQL Server with BI, more recently with the self-service analytics delivered in Office with Power BI, and then the story with SharePoint. Um, that moves to a cloud focus in line with Microsoft's strategy and vision, and tonight we're going to look at the cloud-based predictive analytics services with Azure Machine Learning. That's my background. If you do need to reach out to me with any questions, of course, I welcome them from the audience in front of me tonight. Uh, but otherwise, LinkedIn or email details are available here. This session, broken into two parts, will describe, first of all, what machine learning is. So I'd like to ask the audience that is present here, is there anyone working with data mining or machine learning today? OK, Dave Lane, how am I not surprised? Um, are there any data scientists in the room? Well, I think we've eliminated that. Are you a data scientist, Dave? Oh, I think it's a buzzword. It's a buzzword, is it? I don't mind a buzzword if it pays me a really, really large income. So if you, if you are a data scientist, well, if you're a data scientist, what would that mean educationally? What minimum education do you think a data scientist today would have? Statistics, so university qualification. Bachelor's, Master's, PhD. They could, teach themselves. they could teach themselves. But more formally, what we find today, the data scientist is an emerging profession. It's a shortage at the moment. Uh, specialists that can do amazing things with data and deliver value from data beyond the common you know, activities of business intelligence practitioners today. When we're, we're great at consolidating data warehousing, building data models, enriching with hierarchies and business logic, and exposing that to the business through reports and dashboards. But really, the layer on top of this is how to even drive more value value from data uh, by digging deeper and looking for perhaps more subtle patterns. And uh, we're going to touch on that tonight, that we're really talking about machine learning, data mining, and this is the realm of the data scientist. And the reason that I ask, are there any data scientists in the room, is that um, they're likely to throw some good questions my way. In the absence of them, I'm likely to throw out those answers to those likely questions that would come from a data scientist. So these individuals are highly skilled, typically um, computer science as a minimum, uh, backed up with strong mathematics, and, uh, and a, a drive to discover through curiosity and passion what data can do for them. So typically these are introverts as well. Have you ever noticed that? DBAs aren't the biggest party goers. <laughs> data scientists aren't either. We're going to describe uh, what machine learning is in fundamental terms tonight. Um, I'm going to go through the fundamentals of it, working through the workflow from right from designing objectives right through to publication, and then we're going to uh, wrap up with what can developers do in this space, and perhaps why would we be doing this, to end up with some inspiration by describing various business scenarios. So it's just human nature, I think, that we always want to know what could be, and certainly in a business context, um, that's relevant for driving you know, plans and forecasts. So historically, there's some actually interesting cases where um, political leaders do consult clairvoyance. This is not just myth, sadly. I think there was a famous French president who used clairvoyance to help him with um, war strategy. 
And I think Ronald Reagan had his own type of clairvoyant as well. Now, I'm just suggesting that uh, this is one approach, but perhaps not an approach that you would take in business today. So perhaps you could consider this approach. <laughs> All right, how amazing was this back in 2010 during the World Cup? that an octopus in Germany predicted with 100% accuracy the outcome of six games successfully. Is that amazing or what? No? no? Well, it was newsworthy. <laughs> and I think, sadly, Paul the octopus uh, has since left us. I think he died a couple of years ago. But uh, again, reinforcing the point that we, we really want to know. And uh, we will go to really bizarre lengths like this um, to help us know. Well, we're not here to talk about how mollusks could help us with predicting the future. We're here to talk about machine learning tonight. And in definition, machine learning is a subfield of computer science and statistics that deals with the construction and study of systems that learn from data, rather than what you guys do typically as developers, which is producing code and explicit instructions for a computer to follow. So let me explain this by example. Here's a challenge. I need to add two numbers together. To solve this, we're likely to build a function that would take two inputs, number one and number two. And then I think if you're a C-sharp coder, you'll work this one out pretty quickly. Now, it's pretty much a no-brainer for you guys. But what if the question were a little more interesting? I need to predict customer profitability. And you may well recognize that that's going to be a function of customer demographics the age of the customer, their marital status, their gender, how many children, et cetera, et cetera. And then as developers, you may well be tempted to open up Visual Studio and start writing some code like this. And the question would be, if you were going to take this approach, what would the lines of code look like? Are there fixed rules that you can define that would determine what the profit of a certain customer would produce? Yes, Dave's nodding his head. Dave, what are those lines of code? So we have an on-prem data science guru here. He's saying, OK, SQL Server, since 2005, has a mature set of algorithms that could uh, solve this problem. Since well, since 2000, but mature algorithms since 2005. That one key word was pivotal there. I would debate that happily with you any time. So 2005 was really the maturity of the, um, the data mining engine. So yes, that would be the approach for an on-premises solution. We wouldn't write code. We would learn from data. We would use an engine that would extract patterns from data, and we could then query a model that represent those patterns. OK, so that's the approach. We're not going to suggest that you should write any code here. We still need a function. We need a function whereby we can pass in demographic attributes and the output would be some classification. We're going to take some very carefully prepared data. Oh, I updated this image yesterday. And we don't want that red cross there anymore. Essentially, what we have is carefully prepared data. We have an engine that is extracting patterns and it's outputting, you see with the line, a model. In this case, a very, very sim uh, simple um, linear regression. There's a straight line that allows us to describe uh, an uh, independent variable against a response variable, profit. Okay, And that's what we're going to explore uh, this evening and then talk about how we can embed these into applications. So in machine learning, there's a distinct flow. And like with any project, it's very important to understand what your objective is up front. But most particularly with machine learning, in order to remain focused and designing a solution that really is there to solve one particular problem. Now, as a data expert, if I'm going to produce a data warehouse or data models and cubes, they're very general purpose wrapped around a particular subject. Here is our sales subject area, and here's a data model, and it will answer literally hundreds of different types of questions in relation to sales. But when it comes to machine learning, there's really only one question you can ever really effectively answer from the model. So defining the objective, and tonight in demonstration it will be to take input of customer demographics in association with profit that has been generated perhaps for the prior 12 months. And the objective will be to discover patterns that allow us with a fair degree of accuracy and reliability to predict what profit could be for any particular customer. 
Where do you think this could be useful in an application experience? Knowing something about your customer, your user, your audience, and doing something interesting with a prediction. We see this every day. Marketing. Doing what with marketing? Right, so targeting mail. So, you know, in marketing we say that 50% uh, of your budget's wasted. But what 50% is wasted? All right, so more wisely spending your marketing budget. Instead of sending out that brochure with all your products to everybody, why don't we use mining models to understand our customers and to target those that are more likely, so propensity. Those that are more likely to buy from us will spend money on them. But I'm thinking of a more obvious example that you see thousands of times a day unless you don't use the web. Advertising. Yeah, targeted advertising. That when you're reading a newspaper article, when you're browsing, when you're in Facebook, in fact, when you're in YouTube, earlier we saw you know, recommendations and they're tailored based on their understanding of who you are. All right, they're not driven randomly, they're driven um, looking to increase not just um, satisfaction of the user, but also usually profitability of the business concern that's paying for the advertising. So you can think of tonight's demonstration whereby we're looking to classify any particular customer um, into groups of profitability to drive appropriate targeted advertising. All right, so that would be our objective tonight. We want to provide relevant, useful suggestions and advertisements, and we want to maximize profit. So step two in the flow would be collecting the data. All right, and uh, this could then be the challenge. I, I know as a consultant, you might have the, uh, a need from a customer, but the next step would be, well, what data do you have to support this? All right, so it may well be that as the consultant, I come on board and say, well, great question. Let's see how we can answer this from the data that you have. Give me access to um, your CRM system. Give me access to your sales. And let's see what richness of data we have here. So when collecting data, what do you think are going to be important requirements to meet? We're looking to train a model based on the history and the data that we have. So often when we talk about business intelligence and we talk about supporting decision-making processes, it's about the garbage in, garbage out. If all you have to offer is garbage in, you don't expect the decisions that we made off this to be quality. And so it's really, really relevant here in machine learning that you have good quality data, sufficient data. So sufficient could mean sufficiently wide. It could also mean sufficiently deep that you have sufficient volumes and that that data is current and representative of what your customers mean. So let's start with the demographics here of your customer. Where would the demographics information come from? So sales systems, CRM systems, let's talk in context of a really obvious example, like an e-commerce application. That in order to check out your shopping basket, you need to register. And so the registration process should ask for more information than just an email address and a name. There's not a lot of value that you can mine from the fact that his name is Peter or John or her name is Mary and that she bought something. So you can imagine as developers that when you're designing an e-commerce application, you're setting up the profile page, you're going to make it as rich as possible. You're going to ask probing questions, birth dates, genders, within legal boundaries. So the more you ask, the less they're going to continue. So there is going to be a balance here. So you've got to make it um, easy. You have to make it quick. And maybe you have to somehow, and I don't know how, but you need to um, inspire them with the fact that there's value in doing this. I don't know. If you complete your profile, we'll give you 5% off your first purchase. Why not? So the fact is, all that I'm talking about tonight is useless if you do not have sufficient volumes and richness within your data. Now, there's a great... Um, example to be aware of, especially as UI developers, that we don't want you to fall into the trap of the Afghanistani accountant problem. What do you think this problem might mean? First right, so you can imagine a drop-down list. What country do you come from? What profession are you? And as UI developers, you're there saying, well, let's just default to the first item in the list. And of course, that shopper just looking to register and get to the checkout page as quickly as possible is next, 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 next. What do you think that would mean if we had significant volumes of Afghanistani accountants in the data that we're collecting? How useful would this be? Yeah, skewing the results 
and we'd recognize that something here is not as we would expect. So you'd probably have to do two things. One of two things would be remove all customers from your set that are Afghanistani accountants or remove um, nationality and profession. Or... Okay, so you could derive from um, sales history. Okay, so where was the delivery and that would be the nationality. What would you do for profession? Yeah, or, you know, I'm not sure if there's a way of then doing a loop back and saying, all right, anyone that's an Afghanistani accountant, we're going to send you an email, click on this link and update your profile. You might get a 5% response on that, okay? But here's the point. It's critical that you have rich data, sufficient volumes, representative data, and current data. So what's not to say, well, I don't think people's nationality change in time, but someone's profession could change in time. All right, so this will always be a challenge. Machine learning and data mining activities are only as good as the data that you have available. So I'd ask you as developers to think up front about the design and what you can collect and how you can sufficiently maintain this to ensure down the track when you have volumes of data that we can do interesting things like this. The next thing would be to prepare the data. So the garbage in, garbage out principle is really, really critical. So already detecting that we have an unusually large set of Afghanistani accountants, we've just discussed what we might do to cleanse the data there. What do you think we might do if we have missing values? For example, not everybody is providing a, a profession. Okay, so one approach could be that we could uh, have a small project on the side that might infer and predict missing values based on other data. So that's one possibility. Or if you have sufficient missing values, you might be stuck. The fact is there's not a lot of use if we have more than half the values missing. And again, this is a, a lesson about enforcing that you collect data and maintain it. Okay. Uh, the other thing is you might end up with um, unusual outlier values. You know, we have someone that purchased some beer online and they're aged seven. <laughs> All right, you might detect things that really shouldn't have happened. Either they're data entry issues or they could in fact be real things, but they're likely to skew the results. And what we're looking for is representative data. Other topics that come up here would mean that for numeric data, if you have like income, if people are just passing in a numeric value, you're going to end up with a whole lot of numeric data uh, and we're much more interested in not individual incomes, but groups of incomes. So statistically, we might refer to this as discretization or quantitizing, whereby we're going to put them into bands. These are people uh, classified from 0 to 25,000, 25 to 50,000, and so on. And also for numeric ranges, you might also be interested to uh, normalize them. Certain activities in machine learning would prefer, rather than a wide range of values, ranges normalized between 0 and 1. Okay? Now, we could talk for days on the topic of appropriate data preparation. All right? And there are books written on this, and data scientists will have gone through an uh, enormous amount of study. Again, what it comes down to is the quality of your machine learning will come down to the quality of the available data and the preparation that you've performed for that data. All right, so where my first demonstration kicks off is to show you that I already have some prepared data here in CSV. Fortunately, we have rich demographic information that has been well maintained in the data warehouse. We've been able to easily join this across to a fact table of sales history, and we've filtered this down to the past 12 months. Just go and create sales, subtract cost, and there's a profit metric for each individual customer. All right, now what I want to do is analyze this CSV data, and I also want to uh, manipulate it a little bit. Is anyone aware of a new tool that's been made available from Microsoft, free, as an add-in that allows me to acquire, filter, reshape my data? Now, if this was a, uh, a SQL Server user group, everybody would know the answer. <laughs> you guys as developers perhaps haven't been introduced to um, the add-in that is Power Query. Has anyone installed Power Query? Oh, one, okay. Is anyone, uh, who has heard of Power Query at least? Okay, one or two of you. So this is an extraordinary add-in available to Excel. It's available for Excel 2010 or Excel 2013. I've downloaded it from Microsoft.com Downloads. I've done the install. There's 32 or 64-bit editions that will match the architecture of your Office installation. 
when you install it, you have this new ribbon. And you have the ability to source data from file formats, from database formats, from cloud storage, and remarkably here, look at some of the other formats, including Facebook, um, Active Directory, even Exchange. If you have an Exchange or Outlook account today, you can put in your credentials and you can query in tabular form your mail, your contacts, your tasks, your appointments, and it's all tabular data that you can filter, sort, group by, whatever you'd like to do. So this is the tool that we're likely to see, and this is not a statement from Microsoft, but we see the pattern that they appear as add-ins, like PowerPivot add-in, and then in the next release of Office, it becomes a native embedded feature. So this is currently available as an add-in. It's likely to appear embedded into Excel in future releases. That's my opinion. And I'm going to use the CSV approach here and navigate across to my Azure Machine Learning folder, and I'm going to open up that CSV document. Power Query? No. What you're referring to is Power Pivot. So Power Query is uh, only available as a downloadable add-in at this stage. All right. So what is totally cool about it is it's a what you see is what you get experience. When you open up the query, you can provide it a unique name. This is customer profit. You'll see that there are three steps. The first one, source the data from the file system. The second one, noted, look at this, the header row is in fact the name of the column, so it promotes them to become column names. And then if you notice total children here is left justified, but now it's right justified. It detected that the text data was consistently numeric, so it updated the types. Now beyond these three steps, you can apply whatever steps you like. All right, so that could come down to grouping, sorting, mathematical uh, workings, and so on. Now the reason I'm opening it here is here is all the rich demographics per customer. Now, in technical terms, each row is a case. In this case, it represents a customer. And we have attributes like the unique identifier, first, last name, the current age, marital status, and you'll see just two distinct values, married or single, gender, two distinct values, female, male. We have pre-discretized the data here. In fact, I could use Power Query, and it's very, very rich expression language to manipulate the data into these groups. Number of children, interest to note that there is a null here. Yeah, is that the when you fill in the form? Do you have children? Not that I know of. Sorry, that's a terrible joke. Uh, what we see is there's 14 rows, 14 rows of data where we have missing values, okay? And uh, I'll just delete that transformation. If we look at the number of children at home, we can learn uh, that there are many, many more. Okay, if I really need to know, um, I could do a count, but I'm looking at this thinking there's thousands. Let me delete that. Education, occupation, are they a homeowner, yes or no, how far do they commute? All of these came from the customer profile. And then lastly, as a result of querying our sales history, we could determine the profit that was generated from each of these customers. Now, when you're modeling this, if you're looking to predict a continual numeric outcome, we refer to that as a regression model. Okay, given these inputs, give me a number as an outcome. Uh, what we're more likely to do in targeted advertising is uh, ask for a label and classify them as to whether they're a high, medium, low, or perhaps a very low profit earner. So what I'm going to do is use Power Query to add in a column. And here, and I'm not sure why the UI does this, try the second time and it gives me it. I'm going to create a new column that will be called Profit Label. And there's a very, very rich language available to us. It's actually informally known as M, or formally known as the Power Query formula language. And I'm just going to write up an if here, that if the profit generated is less than f um, 100, then I'm going to classify that as low, or very low. Else, if profit generated is less than 500, then this will just be low. Else, if it's less than 1,500, it's medium. Else anything else is going to be considered high. 
and now I have this in here. If I'm interested to know how does that work from a frequency perspective, let me do a group by, group by the count of rows, and I can learn here as a transformation that you know I've got out of 10,000 customers, there are 17% are high, and at the very low end, we have 1,300. Okay, let me delete that last transformation. At this stage, I'm satisfied that the data has been adequately collected and prepared, so I'm going to come back to the home ribbon and close and load, and the result of that Power Query is then loaded into the Excel workbook. Now, the amazing thing about Power Query that's a little off topic for tonight is that that query can also be loaded to the workbook data model, and that's Power Pivot, but natively, the engine is now part of Office 2013 with Excel. So you can load the result directly into the data model, and it will efficiently compress that data into an in-memory structure to provide very, very fast analytics on top of it. So Power Query, in one sense, is an ETL tool as a self-service offering through Excel. All right, not going to do that. At this stage, I'm simply going to save the workbook back as a CSV. And we will call this the prepared customer profit. And we will close Excel. So what that now means is this will become the input for the learning activities that we'll be doing. Are there any questions so far? Where are we on the clock? We've gone from 12 o'clock by defining the objectives. We want to classify any particular customer into how much profit they're likely to generate based on the experience we have in this business. We've collected adequate data and we've prepared it ready for mining by adding a categorized column. What is the classification of that profit from very low right through to high? Uh, next level is to develop a model. And so we're going to be switching into some development tools in the cloud for this. When we develop a model, we must train it against the data. We don't just blindly accept that it does a fantastic job of prediction. We're always suspicious of anything. And so we're going to use statistically supported approaches to testing the accuracy and reliability of the model. Now, we refer to this process as experimentation. And a data scientist, as well paid as they are, can spend literally weeks working on this problem. By not just creating a single model, they might create dozens of different models with different sets of data, different inputs, different filtered sets of data, different selections of algorithms, different parameters to tune those algorithms, and they'll use appropriate testing methodologies. And ultimately, they'll arrive at a conclusion that this model here has proven itself to be the most reliable and accurate, and this is the one that will then be published or deployed and then hand it across to some developer to integrate and embed into their application. So all of that process will be demonstrated shortly. You will then have operational people that will monitor and ensure that you know, things are running optimally, and around and around we go. So before we get into the machine learning part, it's of interest to note what machine learning and how it is done today with data scientists. Um, if you speak to data scientists, they'll almost always refer to very, very expensive platforms, hardware and software required to drive the processing that they do. So first up front, it's expensive, so therefore it's a luxury afforded by larger organisations today. Dedicated teams for machine learning and data mining, you'll find that the expertise, the hardware, the software um, has very high price tags attached to it. Next thing is isolated data. Preparing data like this may not be so simplistic of just querying a data warehouse. It could involve bringing in external data, third-party data, marketing data, and it could involve a lot of time and effort to get the right data in the right quality and the right shape. It might also involve big data processing, that all of the data representing sales activities or clickstream analysis actually lives in file store in Hadoop, and uh, we need to process it at that level as well. Tool chaos, there's not just one tool that they're going to use, the preparation tools, the mining tools, the evaluation tools, and then the complexity kicks in. That even when they produce the most optimally tuned machine learning model, the next challenge will be how to embed this into an application, especially real time. When you're loading a web page, you don't want this to take uh, more than half a, a second. 
So those predictions have to be slick and fast. And here is one of the biggest challenges that data scientists have today, that while they may have the expertise and tools to deliver fantastic models, there remains the challenge of how they're going to embed that to support real-time predictive capabilities. All right, so we're going to move into the analytics of today. Uh, and that is where Microsoft are becoming uh, a very interesting player in this space because they've produced a cloud-based machine learning service. In fairness, and as Dave's pointed out, is that SQL Server, since 2000, if that keeps you happy, with what two algorithms did it have in 2000, Dave? Uh, decision tree and clustering, I think, were the two. Right, so there you go. So um, notably, SQL Server was the first relational database product in 2000 to release data mining tools as just part of the package. All right. Now, it wasn't until the Yukon release in 2005, Adam, the Ready to Rock launch. Adam was active in this launch in San Francisco, I recall. All right, Ready to Rock launch launched SQL Server 2005 with a mature product called Analysis Services with a data mining engine that consists of nine algorithms. This is on-premises data mining. You can do this today, and I remind my customers that if you have SQL Server licenses for standard business intelligence or enterprise editions, you have this engine available to you, potentially at no cost. If you have installed the multi-dimensional engine for analysis services to deliver cubes, you also have the data mining engine installed on-prem. And there's a fantastic array of things that you can achieve for that with little investment in hardware or software. But we're not here to talk about on-prem data mining or machine learning. We're talking about the new approach in line with Microsoft's more recent strategy and vision around cloud first. So we now have recently released into general availability the Azure Machine Learning Service. It's all geared around faster solutions. And as you'll see tonight, even in demonstration, while we're not suggesting it should be fast that you can do this within a matter of hours, it dramatically improves and increases or decreases the development time, especially in regards to data preparation and for the actual machine learning itself. The beauty of the cloud is as you need more resources, yes, you'll pay for it, but it can scale, so it's elastic. If you need lots of resources to crunch lots of data, um, you can achieve this through the cloud very quickly and easily. Question? So, simple question. If I've got SQL, am I going to ha gain anything from going to the cloud other than elastic cloud, et cetera, et cetera? Other You're going to gain more money in your bank account. I'm sure you'll explain that. Well, in the sense that you already own SQL Server, so there's no investment that you need to make into additional software, right? Now, as a cloud service, you're paying, and we'll talk about pricing later. I mean, what it usually comes down to is uh, how much is it going to cost you, and what's the return on your investment? Okay, so that will depend on many things. So the features available are the same. Uh, if I go Oh, I never said the features so available are the same. But there's a lot of overlap. So depending on whether you're looking to do, as is the demonstration tonight, a classification task, that for any given customer, we want to classify them into a profit group. That can be easily achieved with SQL Server on-premises today. You have four algorithms, linear uh, logistic regression, neural networks, decision trees, and naive bays. All right? Nothing's stopping you having done that for the past 10 years. All right? But our focus is not on-prem just reminding you that you do have that capability. Today, with a cloud-based service, the fact is um, you'll learn that you don't need to install any hardware or any software. In order to develop and deploy and maintain solutions with this new service, you simply need an Azure subscription, you need an HTML5 compatible browser and internet connectivity. That is it. So that is a game player for organizations today that are saying we cannot afford the investment in hardware and software. There is no longer that investment to make. You will pay as you go for the services that you use in the cloud. So the elastic pay-as-you-go model with low operative costs, global scaling, that if we're going to have a predictive service that could predict potentially thousands of adverts, a, a second even, this can scale to achieve that. Now imagine that if you needed this to work on-prem, what type of data center do you need to maintain on-prem to support that? All right, so. There's still a classic balance of sunk cost versus do you have enough sunk cost. If it's already sunk, then the on-prem is compelling. And if your data is, if you've got terabytes on-prem, getting it into the cloud is no mean feat. 
uh, if you've got it up in the cloud, well then clearly it's, if you don't well, have that, then it's easy to go in the th cloud. This is true, but let me add to that, that if you want to embed targeted advertising through a predictive service, through a web app. If your web app is in the cloud, then yeah. Yep, so you've now got a service that's accessible from anywhere on the internet. It's fantastic, all right? So, so there are some differentiating factors already about the on-prem with SQL Server and where we're heading with Azure Machine Learning. All right, so time to formally introduce it and get into some development. So armed with nothing but a web browser, professionals, including yourself, don't think that this is just data scientists. You can start developing prediction models from anywhere so I like to use the example that you could be on a flight from Sydney to Perth with your in-flight connection and you could be doing machine learning. It is possible. Azure Machine Learning also retains a practically unlimited number of files in storage with Azure and connects seamlessly to other data-related services. So big data processing can be uh, used as an input with Azure HD Insights. SQL databases is where your data may reside already in the cloud anyway, or you may have virtual machines hosted in the cloud and you could machine learn off these. Otherwise, and as my demonstration will show tonight, that data must be in the cloud or accessible within the internet, and therefore that CSV document is going to need to be uploaded from my desktop up to Azure Storage for machine learning purposes. So here's how it all works. There are really three different audiences we're concerned with. The first will be the Azure Ops team that are going to provision a machine learning workspace. So let me switch across to my Azure portal here. I have no ML workspaces, and I'm going to go ahead and simply create one. It's very, very straightforward. You just need to come up with a unique name. So I'm going to call this the Sydney uh, .NET user group. Okay, the green tick here says that nobody else has claimed that name. I will be the owner. There is only one data center that supports Azure Machine Learning at this stage, so no selection. It'll be the South Central US. It needs storage, both for your data and all the metadata that describe your workspace experiments. So I'm going to create a similarly named storage account and as simple as that, within a matter of seconds, I've provisioned a workspace. The next thing the ops team are likely to do is to grant permission to various individuals to be able to access and potentially collaborate on workspaces together. So this is another interesting thing that Azure Machine Learning offers, is convenient collaboration that other platforms struggle with. All right, so while this is processing, are there any questions? Now we have success. The ops team enter this, they can manage access, or you can use this to launch ML Studio. ML Studio, for the audience of your data scientists, now this came from a Microsoft marketing slide and I was very happy to append to data scientists that BI developers would also be a target here. Now, one of the selling points, and as you'll see in demonstration, is that it's very, very simple to construct experiments. Drag, drop, connect, configure. It's a visual designer in the web browser. Please don't confuse easy to configure with easy to do. There's still a mastery and a justification as to why data scientists are paid the enormous salaries they typically uh, receive. But what I'm suggesting is that developers, and not just BI developers, but also um, experienced developers like yourself, um, what it comes down to is um, a good understanding of data, a reasonably strong background in mathematics and statistics, and certainly a curiosity, enthusiasm, and passion around what data can do for you. With that combination, I would suggest that you're in a good position, should you want to, to explore the fundamentals and perhaps derive some easy value out of machine learning. But ultimately, to truly drive and especially advanced solutions with machine learning, it's almost always going to be the realm of the data scientist. So, regardless of who you are, it now wants me to reauthenticate. I delayed too long. And is anyone using the new two phase verification? So, in order for me to log in, I need to go to my phone. Drives me nuts, but I like the idea that my naked photos aren't going to be bouncing around the internet. <laughs> All right, just proving the point how secure these platforms are. 
Remember that you're armed with nothing, let me remove the welcome, with a web browser. So any compatible HTML5 web browser, that's going to mean IE, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, and I don't know if Opera is one of them. Now, the two new things that you can create, and let's start with the data set, is that where you do have local data, you're going to need to upload this into your workspace. So I'll browse across to Azure Machine Learning folder. There is my prepared customer profit open. I could provide descriptions for others that might search and look to use this, but I'm simply going to upload it. And CSV is being securely communicated and stored in the Azure storage. It's then a resource available in the workspace for others to discover and use. All right, so if I come to data sets, none found. Oh, it's still uploading. That's remarkably slow. Quick question for you. This portal is... Oh, sorry, I'm in the mic. Yeah. Um, sorry, my quick question is that this portal looks like the old um, Azure portal. Is there any plans to update this to match the new one or anything like that? So, so I don't have an answer, but I have pretty much a good guess, is that this will be uh, retired at some point. So yeah, at, the, at this stage it's in the older form, but I would expect everything will eventually migrate across. Cool. All right. So there we have it. We have one data set. This allows you to either download it again, delete it, maintain it. The other thing that we do in the workspace is define experiments. And I think this is a great terminology because this is exactly what you need to do. There is no single step proven way that every time this is how you'll produce your solution. You're going to experiment. And as I've mentioned, that data scientists can spend weeks on problems like this, trying all sorts of combinations of different inputs and configurations. All right, and so let's go ahead and create an experiment. And when I create them, I'll show you that there are a gallery here consisting of an enormous number of samples. All right, so if you've got a particular problem like, I need to determine whether a flight is likely to be late, yes or no, you'll find that there is an experiment already created to solve this. The sample data set's made available to you, and it's reasonably well documented. So if you have a particular problem in mind, you may well find a sample that matches this, and I'd suggest this could be your starting point. For tonight, I'm going to start with a blank experiment, and it may not seem obvious, but the name of the experiment's across the top. So it will be to predict a customer profit class. All right. This is all in a web browser. No tools needed to be installed. And so the first thing I might do is say, well, I'm looking for something to do with profit. Aha, filtering down the available resources, there is a data set named prepared customer profit. I simply drag it out. And then if you right-click this circle, you get a context menu that pops up. Let's visualize the data that is from that CSV document. So the first thing that I'll point out up here is that you've got 10,000 rows of data and 15 columns. Do you think 10,000 rows is enough data to solve this problem? Yes. Yes. I would think so because it comes from AdventureWorks, right? And AdventureWorks being a <laughs> contrived data system, it's got very clear patterns stored in it. But the answer would be, it always depends. And it just depends on the nature of your data and how subtle those patterns might be. They might be there, but they might be very subtle. The more subtle, the more likely, the more data required to surface them. So it will depend. Experimentation will reveal to you. All right, the selection of the first column here uh, would show you statistics so, not that this makes sense. So for a customer ID that's a surrogate key, really the min, max do make sense, but a median and a mean don't. But we do learn from this that there are no missing values. The histogram really isn't so useful. But when we select something like age, we already see the histogram across the top, and we can learn that this is the distribution of ages of our customers, and that we have no missing values, 69 distinct ages, Lowest is 18, max is 88, the average age is around 38. All right, recall that the total children had some missing values. If we have six missing values, we're probably not likely to get terribly upset with this. That's uh, six out of 10,000. Uh, 10, excuse me. So 10 out of 10,000, what does that mean? 0.1%, something like that. So what are we likely to do? Drop the 10 cases. 
predicate with? Yeah, we're going to substitute missing values. You could use a technique that says, well, let's just use the average or the most common or a constant value like zero. But when we come to the number of children at home, we find there's a much higher proportion. In fact, almost 50% of the data has missing. And at this point, we'd make the decision to remove the entire column. Again, stressing the importance of capturing and maintaining good quality data. Education, so interesting split here. I don't know why I can't scroll down. And ultimately, our profit labels. Alternative, given that you've got 50%, it's just split it into two test sets and then try one model with, one model without. Well, I think what you're suggesting there, Dave, is yeah, just experiment. What would happen if I include it versus not include it? And you'll see that there are techniques that we will always use that are there to determine and uh, evaluate accuracy. So you might include it and discover that it has no impact or a positive or negative impact and make a decision based on that. All right, so let's close that. While I'm here, data doesn't always have to come from a predefined input. So if I bring out the reader, now when you select a component, on the right-hand side you have the properties pane. You may collapse or expand it. And what you'll see here is that you can source data that is publicly available through any web URL. It could be a CSV document sitting on your extranet site. Hive query. So what does that suggest about our data source? Hadoop, right, big data. So structured big data that can be queried by using SQL-like constructs. So this partners very well with another cloud service from Microsoft, which is Azure HD Insight. You could have petabytes of text data that is structured, and you could machine learn against it. So essentially, when it's doing the machine learning, it's querying via a Hive query that's firing off a MapReduce process to make big data smaller data for the purpose of machine learning. Uh, SQL Azure Database, Azure Table or Blob Storage are the other approaches. For tonight, I'm simply going to remove this. Our data is being prepared and uploaded through this data set. Okay. That's the Machine Learning Studio. And I'm thinking this is an appropriate time for a break. We're going to break this into two parts for the purpose of the recording. So stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to develop the experiment, explore various algorithms and determine which is the most accurate and reliable. We'll publish it, and then we're going to go ahead from the developer perspective and embed this into an application experience. Okay, we'll see you soon. Did you get all that? We'll take the SSW TV quiz and test your knowledge now.